OK, <laughs> I think we'll uh, we'll start. So uh, hi, everyone again. Um, thank you for coming to the first talk hosted by the Riot Science, Science Club Exeter. Uh, the Riot Science Club is a seminar series that raises awareness and uh, provides training in reproducible, interpretable, open and transparent science practices. Um, it started in June 2018 at King's College London. It's entirely uh, early career researcher led um, and has now expanded to St. Thomas's Hospital, Rotterdam uh, and Exeter, which are um, us. Um, we, um, yeah, we'd like to uh, point out that there is a Q&A uh, uh, section uh, which you can use to ask questions, uh, post links, um and these questions will then um, be asked at the end uh, we would like to start by thanking to the other uh, riot sites for uh, welcoming us and um, helping us to set up the uh, uh, first talk today um, we'd also like to thank uh, dr florian uh, markowex uh, our first speaker for uh, agreeing to speak to, uh, for us today. Um, Dr. Markowitz can't deliver his presentation live, uh, so we will be first playing uh, his recorded presentation, but he will be live for the Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, Dr. Markowitz is a senior group leader and Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award holder at the uh, Cancer Research uh, UK Cambridge Institute. He uh, holds degrees in mathematics and philosophy from the University of Heidelberg. He has a PhD in computational biology from the Free University of Berlin, uh, and he leads a group at the uh, Cancer Research UK uh, Cambridge Institute, uh, which combines computational and experimental group to understand uh, key uh, cancer mechanisms. Um, so we'll start the uh, talk. Uh, Milton, if you would uh, play. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Florian Markovets and I'm a group leader at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. And today I'll be telling you five selfish reasons why you should be working reproducibly. The work I do in my group is very diverse. Some of us work on cancer genomics and cancer evolution. Some of us work on tumor imaging using both pathology and radiology data. And some of us perturb biological systems, look at the phenotypes and build interaction networks from that. The people who work with me, some are computational, they come from computer science and statistics. Some are experimental, they come from biochemistry or medicine. So it's a whole mix. And what I'll tell you today is what I tell all of them, regardless of their background, whether they're computational or experimental. What I'll be talking about today are really fundamental principles of scientific practice. And the one key thing I need to highlight is there should not be any miracles in science. You might have seen this cartoon before. You see these two elderly men standing in front of a chalkboard. I guess they are mathematicians. On the top left, there are some very complex signs. On the bottom right, there's some even more complex equations. And in the middle, it just says, then a miracle occurs. And one of these mathematicians says to the other, uh, I think we should be more explicit in step two. This is how it feels to me, sometimes at least, when I read a really complex nature paper or cell paper or science paper. There's years of research, very 
complex data sets. And at the other end, there's this paper with its polished figures and it's just eight pages and it's all very dense. And sometimes I wonder, how do I get from the complex data to this short and dense paper? What's in the middle? What happened to translate one into the other? And I, I'm just hoping it wasn't a miracle. I'm hoping the authors can actually explain how they got from the data to their conclusions. Now, sometimes they can't. So I would like to tell you this with like a story of warning, a disaster story. It's called the, 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 the Duke disaster. Uh, and it's a story that highlights people who are very often not at the center of attention in science. It's a story about biostatisticians. The two biostatisticians in question are called Keith Begley and Kevin Coombs. And at least back then, I don't know where they work now, but back then they worked in MD Anderson. And the photo you see here is a photo I took from the webpage of the New York Times. And it's not very often that biostatisticians make it to the front page of the New York Times. But there was lots of attention on some work they had done. And you see the article here is called How Bright Promise in Cancer Testing Fell Apart. It's based on a paper they wrote, a paper in the Annals of Applied Statistics. The Annals of Applied Statistics is one of those journals people call a more technical journal. This is not usually what makes the front page of the New York Times. Their paper was called Deriving Chemosensitivity from Cell Lines, Forensic Bioinformatics and Reproducible Research in High Throughput Biology. We'll come back to this forensic bioinformatics in a second. But let me first tell you, even though this was a more technical journal, it was very impactful. So it ended up in the New York Times, the results end up in The Economist, they ended up in, in TV, 60 Minutes in, in the US and many other places. So they really struck a nerve with their research. So let me tell you what they had done. The situation doesn't start with them in MD Anderson. The situation or the, the story starts with uh, researchers in Duke, the group of Joe Nevins, who back then was one of the top notch breast cancer researchers of the world. He no longer is, which is an outcome of this story. Mm -hmm. And what the group of Joe Nevins had found is, or what they claimed they had found is, that they could do experiments on cell lines. Cell lines are human cells, but they're pretty artificial and they're pretty strange and weird. And they grow on plastic, are very different from your human cells in, in your body. But so they could do experiments on cell lines and treat them with drugs, and they would see which genes reacted to these drug treatments. And from that information, they could predict which drugs would work in patients, in real humans. So there was a big ju a jump between these cell lines, these artificial model systems, and real patients. And this is why their research was, was, was so widely spread and so highly published. So there was a paper here in the New England Journal. New England Journal is pretty terrible when it comes to reproducibility and transparency, but maybe exactly for that reason, my medical colleagues love it a lot. And they also published a paper in Nature Medicine on genomic signatures to guide the use of chemotherapeutics. So this research was so visible that, of, of course, also the uh, oncologists in MD Anderson saw it and they said to their biostatisticians, listen, people, there's all kinds of statistics happening in here. How about you figure out what the people in Duke did so that we can also do it in MD Anderson now? And that's what the biostatisticians, Coombs and Begley, set out to do. But they failed miserably. It was really hard to get the data. They didn't really understand what the Duke people had done. And it went back and forth. They asked them for, for explanations. They were getting some. They were not getting other explanations. It was just a really tough fight just to understand what Duke had done to the data. And this is why they call it forensics. Because after a while, they realized there were lots of problems with the data and the results. And suddenly, Coombs and Begley's work turned into trying to understand what must the Duke team have done wrong to get the results that they have reported? To give you some examples. So as I told you, the Duke folks were looking at genomic signatures, gene activity changes that predicted drug response. And these genes, they have funny identifier names. And that's what you see in this slide. Um, one of the gene identifiers here is called 1881. That's the identity of one particular gene with the technology that had been used to measure it. Now for a signature, you get a whole list of these different genes which are predictive of a certain drug. And what the um, 
And the MD Anderson people had done is they had compared two lists of these genes. One is called theirs, and that is the list that Duke had provided in their publications. And one list is called ours, which is the list that MD Anderson had derived by reanalyzing the data set. And the first observation was these two lists had no overlap whatsoever. That was weird until they plotted them side by side, like here on this slide. It's a slide I stole from Keith Bagley. And so they plotted them side by side and have a look yourself. The Duke people had found a gene called 1881 and MD Anderson had found a gene called 1882. Duke had found a gene called 31321 and MD Anderson had found a gene called 31322. So yes, there was no overlap, but the, there was a system, right? So every time uh, uh, MD Anderson had found something, it was the same number as Duke plus one. It's almost looked like the gene names had been shifted by one row. And that's exactly what had happened because the Duke people had used the devil's tool, Microsoft Excel. I don't call it the devil's tool because the people who use it are bad in any way. I call it the devil's tool because it's just so easy to make mistakes. So what had happened here is that the Duke researchers had to copy the data and the row annotations, the gene names, into another statistical software. And they just did it with copy and paste because this is how you do it in Microsoft Excel. They didn't use scripts, they used copy and paste. And well, the gene names hadn't had a row. I assume it just said gene names at the top. So suddenly everything was shifted by one. They might have noticed that, but they didn't because accidentally, I guess, um, their genes, when you look at what genes these actually are, many of them are known cancer genes, whereas the ones that MD Anderson identified, the real genes, the real gene names, were just pretty much random genes. So Duke, in a way, got lucky by finding really interesting cancer genes just because they uh, moved the rows by one. Now, this is, this is a mistake. This is not yet fraud. This is just something I'm sure has happened to everybody who's ever analyzed data, and I'm completely sure it happened to me. There were other problems with uh, the data which are a bit less innocent. So for example, so I told you the, the task that you had was to predict chemosensitivity. Um, so to do that, you need a training and a test set. The test set has to be independent of the training set and you use it to evaluate how well you're actually doing in your prediction task. Now, in the Duke case, the test set had come from previous publications where uh, some samples had been treated with these drugs. When the MD Anderson people tried to understand how the test set was organized, the first problem they ran into is that the published data had, let's say, 80 samples, whereas when Duke used them, it was 120. So there were many more samples that Duke had used than there were in the original publication publishing the data. So the MD Anderson people said, this is weird and they plotted the heat map you see here on the right. Uh, and it shows in the rows, there are genes and the columns are samples. And if you have good eyes, you see a block structure where very often columns are exactly identical. And for the people without good eyes, there are these two nice magenta um, um, and boxes in the plot. Even weirder, if you look into the columns that all look the same, which look like they're exactly the same data, sometimes they have the same annotation as being sensitive or resistant. That's the blue and red color at the top. And sometimes, for example, in the right box, some samples are uh, sensitive and some are resistant. So there's something really weird happening here with sample duplications and incoherent labels. You see similar information in the uh, in this um, plot uh, just above me, which shows you the correlation matrix between the samples. And the correlation, of course, should be one on the main diagonal, but you see all these off diagonal elements, which also show very high correlations. And these are all these duplicated samples. It's a third of the data set which is duplicated. This is not completely clear how this would happen. And when the MD Anderson people asked the Duke folks what they had done, they got long explanations, they got updates to the data set, but through different revisions of the data set, there was always something duplicated and some labels were incoherent. So it really looked like Duke had no idea how they got to their data. 
This is a little bit less innocent, I have to say, because usually, I mean, what the, the direct result of having a test set with duplicated data is that you increase your success rate, because if you know one of these samples, you know most of the others, unless you were stupid enough to give them the wrong labels. So in summary, the MD Anderson people found lots and lots of problems with the data. So what did they do? Well, first of all, they contacted these major journals who had published the papers, but the journal editors were not very interested, actually. They thought, well, the biological examples are much, much cooler than some weird biostats. The MD Anderson people also talked to the Duke researchers and said there's something rotten in your analysis. Duke was not really open to criticism either. They said, you're biostatisticians, have you even ever published in Nature? What are you talking to us? So they were very snotty about this, uh, in particular because this research agenda looked so, so successful that they had even started clinical trials based on their results, more than one, three at Duke and one at Moffitt. And the Duke people were very reluctant to, 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 to stop those. I mean, this was a major success story for those for them. And Moffitt was a bit smarter. So when they saw there were problems with the data, they immediately stopped the trial. They handed over all their paperwork and they said, listen, if something, if something is funny here, we want to get this sorted. This is part of the reason why it's called the Duke disaster, not the Moffitt disaster. Uh, if you want to see the whole story unfold, go to this talk from 2010, which uh, Keith Begley held in, um, held in Cambridge, and you get an update of how, how this is playing out. Um, the, the end of the story is, it turns out that the first author of these papers, a guy called Anil Potti, was a fraudster. And he had just made up analyses, he had made up data, there were, there were uh, uh, lawsuits, there was, was really, really embarrassing. And the, um, the last offer, actually, it was the end of his career. He went into early retirement. So have, have a go and uh, have a look at Keith Begley's talk. It's, it's very, very funny. Well, funny. Uh, there's some take home messages from me from this Duke story. The first one is, it is true that it involves a fraudster. But for me, the story is not so much about fraud. It is about intransparency. Some of the mistakes in particular, the ones I've shown you are mistakes that can happen to anybody. The reason that they're still in published papers and they survive different rounds of revision is not fraud, it's just complete intransparency. Nobody has ever looked at those data. In the Duke's um, papers, apparently only the first author had ever looked at the data. The last author had not because, I mean, he was a famous PI. Why would he look at any data? And the middle of us thought, oh, it's nice to be on the paper, but why should I work too much? So it was only a single person. And these many of these faults were so much, so, so hidden inside the analysis that it took experienced biostatisticians months to understand what had actually uh, gone wrong. So for me, this is really a warning about intransparency. In particular, because these data sets back then were not that big. Even then you could analyze them on your laptop. So you don't have to be a statistics wizard to find some of these problems. This off by one error, everybody could have checked that if they had, could have found that if they had checked the data carefully. The same goes for sample numbers. If your collaboration partner says, my test set is 120 samples and you look at the paper and realize only 80 were published, you're like, huh, two numbers, what's happening? So you don't have to be a statistics wizard to spot that. The reason it worked in Duke is that nobody even thought about checking the results. That's the real problem. And finally, this is not just a disaster for the first and the last authors who had uh, out of their jobs and uh, uh, can be safely called fraudsters and have to go into early retirement. This is also a problem for all the middle authors on these papers because, well, they are on papers that stink. And I know some applied, for example, to places like Cambridge and then the the hiring committee looks at these CVs and they go like, hey, this just looks a bit rural. I, I don't think we want those people here. Even though as middle of us, they might be completely honest. But if you're involved in a disaster like this, you, you share some of the stink. It's just bad. It's just, you. yeah, even if you're innocent. So because of stories like this, many people have said, well, we need to improve the reproducibility of science, in particular in cancer research. And there are different reasons we should do it. One is 
being reproducible is obviously the right thing to do because it prevents fraud, for example. People claim that reproducibility is the foundation of science. They think it's the honorable thing to do. And also being reproducible definitely makes the world a better place. Now, I have no problems with these reasons. They're good reasons. They just don't terribly convince me. Because partly, I mean, they look very preachy. I mean, pe pe people have to finger up and they preach to me and I just don't like it. I mean, I'm not a missionary myself and I don't want to be preached to. Uh, the second reason is that I think they, I, they, the idea is that they're talking to very idealistic people, do-goodish people who want to make the world a better place. And I can tell you, I'm not wearing sandals. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a do-gooder like this guy. I'm not in this game to make the world a better place. I'm in this game to win it. And when I look at you, I can see it in your eyes. You are also a winner. Now, what do winners want? Winners want to know what's in it for them. So, my fellow scientists, ask not what you can do for reproducibility, ask what reproducibility can do for you. Because working reproducible is a major investment. You have to learn new skills. You have to spend time on doing it. So honestly, you should only do it if you're really convinced it's worth it and that the results, the, the results are worth the sacrifices you have to make. So now let me start to give you some good reasons. The first reason why I think that reproducibility is important is because it helps you to avoid disasters. I mean, obviously, given the story I've told you so far, had the Duke people been more reproducible, had the PI of the Duke papers cared more about reproducibility, his career would have been longer. And it even holds true for in smaller examples. Here is a pretty famous, I think, right now, a piece of paper by a Cambridge student um, who had printed this saying they had lost their external hard drive, which was very important for them because it contains five years of research data, which are crucial for their PhD thesis, and I assume had never been backed up anywhere. And now they had lost the, the hard drive in their backpack and they were really happy, I mean, in the Penton Arms here in Cambridge, and they really wanted people to look for it and then contact them if they found it. If they had just simply backed up the data, they might not have had to write these, these kind of awkward pieces of paper here. Well, it's not just Cambridge students. Uh, here's an editorial expression of concern from the journal Science, which if you don't know, is one of these top-notch uh, journals in, well, science. And let me zoom in on the um, ex uh, expression of concern. Let me read a sentence to you. So this is about a paper um, where people looked at um, fish eating plastic because, interesting. Um, and so there's these two authors called Anna Lernstedt and Peter Oerkloff who published this paper. And these authors, and I'm reading to you the sentence now, have notified science of the theft of the computer the computer on which the raw data for the paper were stored. These data were not backed up on any other device nor deposited in any appropriate repository. These authors look a bit stupid now. I think because of sentences like this, they are now science certified idiots. The funny thing is, if you follow that story, you can just Google it, you will realize it's fraud again because the first author just had made up all the data. Now, the thing is, if you are stupid but innocent and stupid but honest and you uh, actually are not a fraudster, but you still lose the data because you're never backing it up, the problem is you look like the fraudsters. There's no way distinguishing you, who is honest but stupid, from a fraudster who is not honest but tries to hide their bad deeds. So don't look like it, back up your data. Now, it's a lot of fun making jokes about other people's research. So let me finish this part of my talk with an example from my own research. This is a few years ago, we were working with collaboration partners in Berlin on trying to understand which proteins worked in the NF-kappa B pathway. That's a cellular pathway, it's used for, for many different functions and people just didn't know which proteins all played a role in it. So what you do in these cases is um, 
a so-called perturbation screen, in this case of something called RNAi, where you perturb genes genome-wide and you measure a phenotype which tells you something about the activity of the pathway. And for some genes, you will get very strong hits. And then you would say, well, given our data, we assume these genes play a role in the pathway, but unfortunately, you do not know where. So they could be anywhere in this pathway, and from the data alone, you do not know where their position is. Well, I came in and said, I have an idea for you. We, we do another experiment, a follow-up experiment. We, we know something about the pathway. We know other known pathway members. How about we perturb both the known pathway members and the new RNAi hits, and then we use a method that I have produced called nested effect models, and we compare the phenotypes of these different perturbations, and that will tell us where the new pathway members sit. So we did it. We got a beautiful graph out of this. In blue, you see the known pathway members, which are ordered in exactly the same order you would find in a textbook. And in red, you see three new hits, and we have now hypotheses on where they enter the pathway, we did follow-up experiments, people spent years in the wet lab um, um, validating our results, everything worked out fine, we were very, very happy, and we wanted to write a paper. So I say to the postdoc, listen, to write the paper for the supplement, collect all the code, collect all your analysis, I would like to have a reproducible um, 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 document that tells us how we got to this beautiful result. I don't hear from the postdoc for two weeks, after two weeks, he comes and says, hey, Florian, about this reproducible uh, document, <laughs> you will laugh, this is really funny. I have no idea how I ever got to this graph. Um, I, because you see, I, I don't, actually don't remember which parameters I used in the method. Honestly, the version of the method, I can't remember that either. And I think the data changed. Yeah, actually, I think the data changed. I think that's the reason. I said, oh. So you don't know the parameters, you don't know which software you used, and you don't know which version of the data you used. I mean, this is terrible. So what had happened here, we couldn't publish this. I mean, this paper is completely dead because think about the story again. We have a nice data set, we have a validated model, and when people ask us, how did you go from one to the other? We say, a miracle occurred. We don't know how we got there, but it looked good. This is, un this is just not science, this is just terrible. So years of our work, years of collaborators' work wasted because we had not documented our analysis from day one as we should have. And for me, this was really a wake-up call that I improved the reproducibility in my own lab because I don't need this waste. I, I, I want to have a career here, you know. So the things I learned from this is that a publication is more than just a beautiful result. As I said, there should be no miracles. You have to explain how you got to that result. And if you start with reproducibility earlier, you will save time later. Because my postdoc, if he had just done his research right and take note of all the parameters and software versions he had used, he would now have a very beautiful paper. And it would have been a good outcome. And uh, I wouldn't have to tell this story here. And, and it's all very awkward. And I, I feel a bit stupid telling you this. So the second reason why reproducibility is important is because it helps you to write papers. And writing papers is what science is all about. So here's an example from my own research. It's a paper in ovarian cancer where we look at the spatial and temporal heterogeneity in uh, ovarian cancer using a phylogenetic analysis. It's in the journal PLOS Medicine from, I don't know, I think five years ago. Now, if you look at the left where the um, in all the materials that happen uh, that, that accompany the paper, if you go down here, you find supporting information, and there is a file which is called a SWE file. SWE is, an, is a funny word they use in the R community, or they back then they used it, which means it's documented code. So if you look at this file, you find something that has R code in it, but it also has normal text. And if you click this button here at the top that says compile PDF, you will get a beautiful PDF which still has the code in it, but it also has the output of the code, the result of the analysis. In this case, a simple table of all the data. The beautiful thing is, if the data had changed, and if we run this code again, it would automatically show you the new version of the data. 
And if you had used the data to compute something like a beautifully small p-value and you change the data, then all these computations would also have been redone and you would know that all the numbers you have computed are always based on the latest version of the data that you're using. And that is important because in this framework, it's just very easy to look up the right numbers and put them in the paper. The results automatically update when the data change. It is much more engaging because many more people can look at an analysis. You're not in a situation where just the first, first author can look at the data. If you have a nicely documented piece of analysis, lots of people can read it and ask questions and do sanity checks. And in general, it becomes much easier to spot mistakes. So here's another example from the same collaboration. James Brenton, colleague in Cambridge and I were sitting together thinking about an analysis and we were very surprised that some sur survival analyses didn't come out the way we had expected. And one of the variables in there was the stage of the tumors and we were expecting numbers between one and four with lots in num uh, low, uh, uh, low stage. Because the data were easily available, we could do simple analyses ourselves. It was very easy just to say, well, let's look at the observed stages and plot a table of them. And what we found to our surprises, uh, there were no stage one cancers in there. There were stages two, three, four, 999, one stage called John, and a couple of stages called XXX. So apparently the people who had given us the data had not done a good job in curating it. Now, of course, I could have just told the student or postdoc who worked on this, well, figure this out for me. But because the data were so accessible, we could just do it ourselves within five minutes and we immediately knew where the problem is. This just makes the scientific, the updating the paper and, and the scientific work much, much easier. Now, in particular, it makes it easier when you want to, uh, when you have to argue with reviewers. So for the same paper I just told you about, uh, the one with the phylogenetics in ovarian cancer, um, we had this really nice reproducible um, um, document attached to the paper. And one of the reviewers said, I downloaded the author's data, I tried out a variation of their analysis, but this suddenly gave me an insignificant result and he showed us this really flat line that he had found. And we looked at it and we said, well, thank you for this. And the reason is, is uh, we have came up with a reason. We said, well, if you do it right, then you get the nice curve whoops, that you actually should be getting. Why is this cool? This reviewer was completely on board. This reviewer was so engaged in the review process that they actually worked on our data. And reviewing and answering reviewer comments was a very constructive discussion about what is the right approach to analyze these data. I mean, this was very far from just a reviewer dismissing the whole paper or feeling a bit bored or saying some random comments. It was very concrete. It went down to individual lines of code and it was very, very constructive. And we could only do it this way because we had produced a document that delivers the data in an approachable way that enables these constructive discussions. The next reason why reproducibility will be very, very important for your career is because it enables continuity. I'm sure you have said something like this before. My boss said I should continue the project of a previous postdoc, but that postdoc is long gone and left no scripts, nor data. I mean, what do you do? You're stuck, you have to start from scratch. Isn't this terrible? If that postdoc had written down their analyses in a nicely documented format, you could just continue. You would save for lots of time. Or maybe you have said something like this, I'm sorry, I did this analysis six months ago, implying that of course you don't know how you set different parameters or which version of the software you used. I mean, uh, it would take an elephant to have a memory like that. This is what my postdoc told me when he couldn't remember how we got to this very nice tree which killed the project. Um, again, if you had a nicely documented piece of code, you could answer these questions even after six months or 12 months or three years. And sometimes it's not even six months. Sometimes you're so busy, you can't remember all the details of all your projects. And again, if you spend a little bit of time on documenting them well, you have no problem whatsoever. The take home message here is 
that generally the first reuser of your data will be your future self. And unfortunately, your past self is not answering any emails. So you have to proactively help yourself understand your work. Now, the last reason why reproducibility is so important that I want to discuss here is that it helps you to build your reputation. Uh, this is a snapshot from a web page called Bioconductor. It's um, lots of people use it in the genomics community. It's where the R community puts all their uh, genomics and uh, biology packages. And some of these packages are called experiment packages. They contain data and they contain analysis code and they completely, or at least the way we used it, completely reproduce the results in the paper we published. In this case, a paper uh, with our colleague Klaus Mulder, which came out in Nature Biotech. These packages, they have a, a DOI, they are citable. Uh, I just put them in my CV and I don't have one of them. I have more of them. And nowadays I also have a GitHub page for my lab and we have all kinds of code here arranged on, 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 on GitHub. All of these things are in my CV as research output of my lab. And all of my group leaders, my students and postdocs have these packages and they are the repository links in their CVs showing how productive they have been. And other people can just go, these are public repositories and check on them, look at the code and just see that they did very solid work. And this is important because as you know, longer CVs, are better CVs. In particular, it will be more and more important to work like this because all the big journals care much more about open research culture. This is a snapshot from a paper by Brian Nosek from a few years ago, um, introducing the top guidelines. It was in the journal Science, which as I already said, is one of these top notch journals who are trend setting. You don't have to read all of this, but if you look in this table, for example, in the, in the third row on code transparency, and if you look at the highest level that they propose, it says that the code must be posted to a trusted repository and the reported analyses need to be reproduced independently before publication. This is actually what I just described to you. GitHub or these bioconductor packages, they are independent repositories. And the kind of documented code that I've described to you in our case has already been validated by an external reviewer. So if you use these simple tools, you will already operate at the highest transparency levels that journals like science very soon will require of everyone. And you should be a trendsetter, so do it now already. So to put all of this together, here are my top five reasons and very selfish reasons because every single one of them will help you in your career to work reproducibly. First of all, you stay in the game because you avoid disasters. It's easier to write papers. It's easier to talk to reviewers. Uh, it's about the continuity of your work and your reputation. So what? Well, there's some I've given this talk very often and there's some things people have uh, told me and I, I will discuss some of the objections and comments I have heard. The first one is, just because you do open science, you're not necessarily right. And that is true. I'm not claiming I'm right. I'm just claiming it's easier to find mistakes. I don't know, do you guys have a dog? Anybody here has a dog? So imagine your dog comes into the house and takes a shit. Would you like it if you can see that or if it's just smeared underneath the rug? Well, scientific mistakes are a bit like dog shit. It stinks less if you can clean it away easily. So the thing about open science is more, it's just more easy to clean up the mistakes. You're not just, you're not necessarily right because you do. Uh, some people have said, well, all this reproducibility stuff is just for nerds with OCD. And I don't completely agree with this. Lots of it is actually, if you're effective in documenting your code, uh, you have to put yourself into other people's shoes. You have to think, what does somebody else see? What does somebody else feel when they look at my code? Do they feel they understand it or do they just feel confused? And this I have to say is much more empathy than it is OCD. 
It's only the result that matters. Well, this is obviously very, very wrong, as my example of the NF kappa B pathway shows, because the result was, I still think the result was pretty much true. It's just, it looked like a miracle had happened and there should be no miracles in science. Some people say, I'd rather do real science than tidy up my data. And I have to tell you, if you do non-reproducible science, if you're a miracle worker, you're not doing science at all. We can always sort out the code and data after submission. I guess you could. It's just in my experience, nobody does it. Once you've submitted, you just wait, you just sit there. There is no incentive whatsoever anymore to do it. So the best way, the only effective way is to do it before submission, to set it as your own goal, to have your paper reproducible. Also coming back to our NF Kappa B example, if we had waited to figure out reproducibility after submission, we might have been in the very awkward situation that we would then have to write to the paper and to the journal and say, oh, we're reporting this pathway, but actually on second thoughts, we have no clue how we got there. What would we have to do? I mean, to be honest, we would have to uh, re uh, retract the paper. Some people say my field is very competitive and I can't risk wasting time. And I say, and that's exactly why you should do reproducible science, because if you invest a little bit of time in the beginning, it will pay off in the end. Well, this is more for people like me who are computational biologists. And sometimes we are told if there's wet lab validation, who cares if the computer stuff is reproducible? Now, there's two comments I have. First of all, this somehow assumes a hierarchy here where wet lab validation beats computational results, and I do not subscribe to that. But second of all, it more highlights the weakness of most wet lab work, because how reproducible is that? And how well uh, documented are these uh, wet lab experiments? I believe in a few years, it will be just very natural to have documented code in every paper, but it will be as natural to have electronic lab notebooks as supplements to papers so people can check what you actually did in your experiments. Some people say, well, Excel works just fine. I don't need any fancy R or Python or whatever. And it is true, Excel works for parts of the project, in particular in the beginning when you have to fill in lots of data by hand. But at some point you need a data freeze and you have to stop cutting and pasting and you have to start coding and scripting. And at that point, Excel is the devil's tool. Mind your own business. I document my data the way I want. And I'm like, that's so cool. Please do it whatever way you want. It's just important that you do something. The current reward structure does not enough to incentivize data sharing. That might be true, but I mean, honestly, you've just heard five really selfish reasons to further your career by being more reproducible. What more incentive do you need? Do you want a brownie? Do you want a pat on the back? I mean, just have a great career by using reproducible tools. So how do you get started? Here are a few baby steps towards reproducibility. Uh, maybe you think this is funny. So there's this painter and uh, their friend and the friend says, painting is beautiful. What do you call it? And the painter says, Mona Lisa, final reel update, final six. The reason you might think this is funny because this name might remind you of the data structure and uh, directory organization of many of us where you have, for example, your PhD project in a folder next to your vacation plans, your birthday party and your shopping list. And if you look into the PhD project, you see data from 2017 and some certain date, data version three, uh, final data version two. Um, oh, here's some movies. The Princess Bride is a great movie. Oh, here's the thesis text. So it's just a whole mess. So if you think, how would somebody who has not done this, who's not really into the details of everything you did, if you just give your friend this, 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 this uh, mess, would they be able to understand where your data are, which data you used, where your code is, and how you got to the final results? I don't think they would. So one of the simplest things to, to be more reproducible is to clean up the folder structure of your projects. 
and that is called a tidy folder structure. And it has four parts. You have data, you have scripts that work on the data, you have results that come out of the scripts that worked on the data, and then you have documentation and papers which describe the results that you got out of the scripts that worked on the data. And so you see these arrows pretty much going from left to right. And the cool thing is if in this structure, I always know where to expect certain types of files and it makes it much easier to find what I'm looking for. A second tip is uh, to use tidy data. So I want to explain in this example here what the difference is between untidy and tidy data. The top table here is not very tidy, even though it's very small, and it describes measurements taken of different species in different habitats who have different weight and length and there are different uh, positions of the planet and they were taken at different dates. Now, if you look at this for a second, there's, there's some things you will realize immediately why this is not very intuitive, this table. For example, the weight measurements, sometimes they're pounds, sometimes they're kilogram. The length, feet and meters, latitude and longitude change here. The date in all different formats. So it's just, there's lots of work that needs to be done to just unify it and make the different entries comparable. If the authors had spent a little bit more time on this, they would save time in the end. And the time is well spent to make this a tiny date, a tidy data package. And it turns out the data is only the weight in kilograms, for example, and the length maybe in centimeters, but it's, it's, it's defined and specified what measurements units we use. And everything else is metadata, which just describes how, when, and where these measurements were taken. And instead of just typing stuff, you use codes like a station code or a species code. Uh, the importance here is if you make, if you, if you have uh, a typo, for example, and you forget how many S are in Mississippiensis, and you might have, you might end up with writing alligator Mississippiensis uh, differently in, 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 in different entries here. But if you just say, well, this is species code 551771, you just put the same code everywhere and all these details, what class it is, what genus, what species, uh, they're just automatically updated. If you realize, oh, we got this wrong, actually it wasn't an alligator, actually this was a giraffe, you would just update particular uh, information here and it just pulls through to all uh, the other places where this information has been used. Uh, I, I'm just hoping you, you know the difference between the alligator and the giraffe in the first place. Anyhow, so it's really important rather than just writing everything up here in whatever units you want, I spent a little bit of time defining the units and define the work on the difference between the data and the metadata. This will save you time in the long run. Just as an example, how it will save you time, here, this is a quote from an email I got from the, nature, from the uh, journal Nature Genetics, uh, which is one of the nice journals. And they were writing us um, when our paper was accepted, and they told us that any supplementary tables which were to be published here had to be, ideally, modeled on tidy data standards. And they were actually citing a web page which comes from the R project, so even the genetics journal is now citing uh, programming web pages to define in which format they would like to see their data. So this is just, just showing you how these kinds of principles I've been discussing will be ubiquitous very soon in all different areas. The reason for this is that on tidy data, it's much easier to program and to be reproducible, less clicking and pasting and more scripting and coding is important. You don't want to have these off by one errors that you people had just because you have to cut and paste from Excel. So to sum this up, when do you need to worry about reproducibility? Well, before you start the project, because there will be skills that you have to learn while you do the analysis, because if you wait too long, you might have forgotten important information. When you write the paper, because you want to make sure you use the right numbers in your paper. When you co-author a paper, because never trust the first author. 
even after you've published a paper, because people might have questions about what, what you've written up there. And it's the easiest for you to answer these questions if you can just look it up in your well-documented code. And when you review the paper, because we are part of the system, we are part of the community, and the standards we have e most easily show when we judge other people's work, for example, by re reviewing a paper. So if you review a paper and people are not making the data and code available, reject it. So the simple answer when you need to worry about reproducibility is always. So who needs to work on reproducibility? Well, the students and the postdocs, in a way their task is to learn the tools and apply them in daily work. And PIs like me, we need to create a culture of reproducibility in our labs. We have to tell people and we have to show by example that we value these efforts, that we value the time students and postdocs put into working reproducibly, and that we think this is a core part of scientific work. And with that, I'm done. I've presented five very selfish reasons to work reproducibly, and I hope you all use these, use the tips I had for you, and I hope you all have great careers. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Markowitz for a great uh, presentation. Um, thank you for it. And, uh, um, we're now going to um, move to the uh, Q&A uh, section of the talk. Um, I'm, I'm just having a look. Some people actually were able to like the question, so I think we'll go for the, we'll start with the more voted ones, if that's okay. Um, so the, the, the most voted one um, from uh, Elizabeth, uh, thank you for a very nice and engaging talk. I was thinking about what you said regarding only one person actually looking at the data. What can be expected of co-authors in this situation? Should every co-author check every step of the way or should we include a dedicated person in each project to check the data and the code and are we fine trusting two pairs of eyes? Hello guys, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Nice. Oh, so first of all, thank you all very much for listening to my ramblings. This is a very good question. Um, in my own field, in, in, in medical research, I mean, there's just so many authors on a paper and my own expertise is so small that I would personally not be able to check every part of a paper. And I don't think anybody has to. Well, the very last author should have a pretty good idea, I have to say. Uh, but I can tell you what we do in my own lab for the computational analyses. We always have a second person check all the results. So the idea is if you work on a project, you produce a more or less reproducible result, your code goes into a repository, and then somebody else in the group who was not involved in the project spends a day trying to reproduce it. And ideally it should go very quickly because if, if you put all the code there and it works and the, the document that describes your analyses is well described and makes intuitive sense and just works, this person might spend an hour or so just running this through and reporting, everything seems to run. This I feel is the bare minimum. The, this person is not checking whether your approach makes sense, but at least it's checking that the data are available, the code can be installed, and there's no obvious, like it's like obvious sanity checks. And I think that that's something we should require in most, um, um, for most publications, because I don't think it is too much work. Brilliant. <laughs> um, the other question were from um, well, anonymous, but uh, you said writing papers is the whole point of doing science um, or um, similar. Uh, so should we seek to change the format of papers such that they are more like data computational notebooks, uh, R Markdown, Jupyter, uh, with data and code embedded? Uh, would that help to incentivize uh, reproducible work? And what downsides are there? of such an approach. All right. 
So first of all, let me apologize. It wasn't clear that some of the things I said were a bit tongue in cheek. So I actually think there's other things to science than just write papers. I mean, just figuring out stuff and maybe I'm in cancer research, helping patients might be good. But when it comes to the format of papers, um, I indeed think they need to change. So the current way papers that people think about papers, it's like they were written in stone. You write this up, it goes through peer review, it gets like stamp of approval, and then the only thing you care about is this one line on your CV where you just say, I did this and I published it well. And the only thing that matters is your next paper because that will be the next line on your CV. What does not happen is that you go back and, and say, well, actually we made a mistake here, let's fix this. And that is because the way papers work is very static. They're honestly, I mean, they, you can, Sometimes, I mean, if really something big went wrong, some massive error, they might be retracted. Or if something else really big happened, uh, there might be a, um, um, a, what, a correction or something. But what I mostly think about is uh, small mistakes. Um, you, you, you figure out that you set a parameter wrong and there was a scaling factor wrong and some of your data changed and the main results are still there, but every little plot that you plotted in a bit quantitatively changed a little bit. In the current system, your best strategy is just to keep mum about this because there is no way to go back to the journal and say, listen, the paper still stands, but every figure changed. What do they do? I mean, most when we had a case like this in our institute and the editors just freaked out and were talking of a retraction. And it was not a retraction, everything was fine, except that, well, everything changed. I mean, it, it can still be okay. And now it was better than it was before because now this mistake was found. So I envision getting journals to have more like, be, be less static and have more more like um, updates and, and, and uh, bug reports. Think of it like versions of a paper. Think of it like the same way software gets patched and there's updates to it. And we actually approve of this. We think the software gets better in the process. And the same way these papers should get better uh, by just having regular bug reports. This might be making them look more like Markdown or Jupyter notebooks. I'm not sure how it will look like, but I think the 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 perspective needs to change on what is a paper and how static is it. Thank you again <laughs> for the great answer. Um, the the next most voted one uh, is actually um, Ellie uh, and, and mine. Uh, we were just curious, so because you gave really good examples of um, of, of the self of the five selfish reasons to to do reproducible science but we were just curious if uh, if there was like a, a specific timeline and a specific event that triggered this or was it sort of a gradual transition from um to take you to this stage where uh, where now it just makes sense to do it this way I think for me, it really took off when I became a PI. So some of the tools like these R markdowns or the previous versions of this called Sweet Files, um, I knew as a PhD student, but um, during my PhD, we used them, but they were not a big issue. We thought that was nice, but I mean, nobody really cared. In my postdoc, which was great, but nobody really cared about this. Um, and then I became a PI and I suddenly had to I had to answer the question, how do I want science to be done? I mean, what are the values of my group and uh, what do I teach people and what, how do I set up this group? How, what, what, are the, what are the principles, how we do science? And then I realized actually our stuff being reproducible is something I, I really value a lot. Uh, and part of it were stories like, I mean, the, the, the Duke disaster was pretty early on in my career as a scientist. I mean, I started in 2009 and that's exactly the hot phase um, of the Duke disaster. So I found it really hard doing, doing cancer genomics, hearing these stories and not reacting in any, any constructive way. So, and at that point I started just trying to enforce it more in my group. Um, so I used the top-down approach. I know many people, and maybe you in, in included, use more like the bottom-up approach where it's more um, uh, junior researchers trying to establish a different culture. I was in a different position. I was a group leader, a very junior one, but I used the top-down approach. I just put down my foot as hard as I could and said, from now on we work reproducible. And then I realized nothing was happening. 
because my as I mean some of the quotes I had in the who gives a, who, who cares uh, part of the talk uh, come from my postdocs who were like oh yeah we kind of intellectually understand why this might matter but it's a lot of work we have so much work already I mean why, why should we really care let's just do it later and so for me it was a process over several years of a convincing people but more importantly having examples so the next generation of postdocs when they came in i did not have to convince anymore that much i just told them this is how we roll if you sign on for a postdoc in my lab you're expected to have these kinds of documents and share your code there is no other way so the first generation i had to convince and the second one there i didn't give them a choice okay um and that um answers uh part of the of, of another question um uh, which is uh, if you feel like uh researchers respond differently to your talk based on their on a different career stage um might be <laughs> this is actually a diff uh, this is a difficult question because the most enthusiasm i see from junior people um, the junior people, are, I, I know very few, I mean, there's the story of a bishop here in Oxford, but there's very few senior people who are like super enthusiastic about this. Most of my colleagues and in my institute are more like, sure, why not? I mean, it's good if it happens, but they, they, they don't really, they're, they're not getting really emotional about it. And it's more like the junior people, I think, and it might be because they actually feel the pain of not getting the data they want or not being able to reproduce a result. And maybe their actual day-to-day -day research suffers a bit more. Um, but so for me, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I, I don't see general rules whether it's more junior or more, 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 more senior people because I have examples of both. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, Thank you very much. I think we um, uh, we, we asked all the uh, excellent all the questions. Um, it, it was really interesting um, to listen to the talk and very very engaging. Um, and and thank you again for for joining us. Um, no problem. So that was the first meeting of, of yes. So um, then, well, thank you very much for making me the first speaker. Uh, I feel very honored, and I wish you guys all all best uh, for the thank future. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yes, um, and I'll um, we'll close the uh, our first session. Um, thank you, um, everyone, for um, for attending our, our first talk, and we hope you found it uh, really interesting and engaging as well. Um, next week. Um, we uh there is a, a a different talk so the next talk will be on the fifth uh, 15th of october sorry at uh, 12 o'clock uh, and it will be run by the uh, king's college riot science club um, they will be hosting uh, dr uh, priya silverstein uh, who will be talking about easing into uh, open science um, thank you uh, very much again and We'll see you soon.